So as you all have probably figured out by now, as a preacher, I really enjoy preaching through entire books of scripture in a series, right? I really enjoy that. And there are two basic reasons why I enjoy this. It may seem somewhat obvious, but the first one I will share is that it's a joy. It's a joy for, for me to dig into God's word, especially those difficult passages, you know, like the majority of the book of Revelation. You know, and it's a joy for me to dig deep and, and try to make sense of it and try to see what God's saying to me and to our church and the practical implications of that rich truth. But the second reason why I like preaching in series is a little selfish because it makes knowing what to preach about the following week a lot easier. Right? So it's right there. The text is right there. Because just knowing what to preach on is half the battle. It really is. We will start a new series, by the way, uh, soon. Um, but for the month of July, because there's just so much going on uh, this month, it just seemed right that we just kind of tackle individual you know, topics each weekend. And we're doing that today as well. The inspiration for this week's passage is one that I don't enjoy. It came from a place that I struggle with from time to time, if I'm honest. Since the early part of quarantine, actually, and to this day, it's, uh, it's been a struggle for me here and there. It hits me, actually, mainly when I'm trying to fall asleep. No matter how tired I am, I'll just be lying there for hours on end. And it hit me this past Thursday night as well. So that's the inspiration. Sometimes you're inspired through things you read in scripture or through, a, through some positive word you hear, some positive experience you have. But sometimes you're inspired through a sleepless night. And that's where we are today. Referring to the fear of death. It's not something that cripples me all the time, but it is a struggle sometimes. And admittedly, I feel a sense of shame and embarrassment to admit that. Not only because I'm a Christian, but because I'm a preacher. I can't help but to feel guilty because I should set an example to my congregation of my own fearlessness when it comes to death. But church, I can assure you, as many of you know very well, pastors are very, very human. Far more human than you'd like to think. Far more human than we ourselves would like to be. We struggle, too, a lot. And part of what makes it even harder, if I may just be honest, as a preacher to struggle with this is because of the platform I have as a teacher of God's Word. But that being said, I'm thankful to share this message today because it hits home for me personally. It's a message that I need to hear just as much as any of us in this room. And I hope that this message will be one that gives you perspective and peace and God willing, if, if you struggle with this too, the power to overcome your own fear of death as the power of God's word speaks into the secret places of your heart today. Let's go ahead and pray uh, before we go any further. Let's, let's invite the Lord to speak once again. Lord, I just want to pray for all of my brothers and sisters, myself included, of course, Today, as we go into this message, that it would speak indeed into the secret places of all of our hearts, whether it's the fear of death or the fear of anything else that is crippling us today. Holy Spirit, I invite you to just probe into our hearts and our minds and our lives and just speak your truth. Speak to us in the way that we need to be spoken to. Lord, we invite you to glorify your name in this time. And 
in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's start with this question. Why are so many people afraid of dying? There's a spectrum, of course. I mean, your average person has some level of fear of dying. I think that's pretty normal to have that. But on the far end of that spectrum is this kind of fear that's so crippling, so intense, that it affects your daily life. And there's actually a term for that, thanatophobia, or death anxiety. It results in panic attacks, which I've experienced before, shortness of breath, which I've experienced before, although sometimes I wonder if that's because I live in Porter Ranch, and it's like hard to breathe sometimes. I'm like, Lord, do we need to move out of this place? Like, this is this is weird. Why do I have shortness of breath? It happens sometimes. I don't know if you guys struggle with that sometimes, just shortness of breath. Heart palpitations, which I've experienced before. There, there are different symptoms. But wherever you are on that spectrum, it's safe to say that the effects of COVID over the past couple of years, probably heightened all of us in, in our awareness of death, in our fear of dying. But why? Why has this been such a common fear human beings have shared from the dawn of time? You know, why do we duck and take cover if we hear things that sound like gunshots? Why do we desperately try to come up for air when we're drowning. Do you think about that? Do you think, should I come up for air? No, you just desperately try to come up for air. Why do we do that statue pose when you feel what could be an earthquake? You know that, you know, everyone does that, right? Am I the only one that does that? Right, the, did you feel that, you know? There's something innate within us that wants to live. We want to survive. We want to live. We don't want to die. Where did that come from? Why is that the case? What's the explanation? Well, we could turn to science. I'm not a scientist, but my guess from what I've learned about various disciplines within science is that science would probably tell us that our survival instincts are adaptations we've developed over time as part of our evolutionary process. We could turn to anthropologists or sociologists who would likely conclude the reason why we value life comes from learned behaviors over many generations in which death was mourned and life was celebrated and protected by our respective communities. We can turn to many different disciplines for answers, but I believe it would be hard, it would be really difficult to, to find an answer that actually addresses the origin of this. Where did this come from? Really, from the beginning. Scripture gives us an answer to that. Scripture doesn't shy away from the question of origins at all. In fact, science in general struggles with the question of origins. It can explain processes very well. The laws of physics have never changed. But it can never really address the question of origins. Scripture doesn't shy away from that. It's very clear on the question of origins. From the beginning of Scripture, we're told that we value life because we were made in the image of God who is the God of the living, the God of life, the God who is the author and creator of life, the God who hardwired us to celebrate and rejoice when there's new life coming from the womb, and who hardwired us to mourn when life ends. It's part of how God made us. You know, from the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God made life to be eternal. Death only entered the picture because of sin. So from the very start, whether you believe it or not, the Bible gives us a clear narrative 
clear insight as to why the reality of death is and always has been so disruptive, so disturbing, so depressing to humanity because we were created to live eternally. We want to live. It's part of how God made us. But death did enter the picture. Death disturbed God's design. So how interesting is it that the most famous Bible verse of all time, John 3.16, addresses the issue of death, but reveals also the deeper problem, the deeper issue at hand. Let's say it together, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's a quote from Jesus, speaking to Nicodemus. And if you're reading that verse for the very first time, it may sound like believing in Jesus Christ makes you immortal. Right? I mean, if you're just looking at it at face value, that's what it sounds like he's saying. And in a sense, that is kind of what he's saying. But it leaves us with the obvious question. How can Jesus say we will not perish when everyone will eventually die physically? Or put another way, how can Jesus promise eternal life when we all know one day we will physically die? Here's the critical point I think Jesus was making. The critical point that the gospel addresses so powerfully. And it is this. Our core identity, our core identity goes far deeper than our physical existence. Our core desire for life, our core being, goes beyond our physical existence. It's a perspective only God's word can reveal to us if we have ears to hear. Because you know what's one of Satan's most dangerous and successful schemes against us, especially here in the materialistic West, is this belief, this lie that many have come to believe that our physical existence is what matters the most. Our physical existence is what matters the most. And that's part of the reason, perhaps, why people are so terrified of dying. Because we've fallen into the trap of believing that this life is all there is. It paralyzes us. Fills us with a deep sense of anxiety when we think of death. Because we think of death as the end. But God's Word reveals a very different narrative. That we're not just flesh and blood. We are embodied souls that were created for eternity. That said, there's an interesting passage that maybe you've never quite caught before in your Bible reading. From Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. This is from the New Living Translation. Here's what it says. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives. Listen. Listen. As slaves to the fear of dying. I, I did a double take when I read that passage this week. Wow. So scripture is telling us. Our Savior not only gave his life to atone for our sins. But he also gave his life to help us overcome our own fear of death. He faced death just head on. He faced 
face the fear of dying head on. God knows how disturbing and frightening the reality of death is to so many of us. So he did what only he could do to give us genuine freedom from the fear of death by sending his own son to face that fear for us and to conquer it through his victorious resurrection. And if Jesus is our great high priest, as Hebrews 4 declares, that means he faced all of the weaknesses as human beings that we face, including the fear of death. So he can comfort us in our own times of weakness and need. So that may be surprising, surprising to hear. It was surprising for me to hear, but it made sense. It gave me a new kind of insight into what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was afraid of dying. It's weird, right, to think about that. He's God. Why would he be afraid of dying? Well, then why was he praying this in Matthew 26, 38, in the Garden of Gethsemane, shortly before his betrayal? Jesus told Peter, James, and John, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. And then verse 39, it records what Jesus prayed to the Father. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet not what I want, but may your will be done. This is one of the most mysterious and revealing passages, I believe, when it comes to the nature of Christ, that he was fully man and yet fully God. What a paradox that is in that very moment, because as fully God, he knew how painful this death was going to be. And as fully man, he was deathly afraid of it. You think he went to the cross, you know, as if he was emotionless? As if the pain wasn't real for him? He was absolutely terrified of dying and dying that way. But he did. He obeyed the will of the Father. Though it crushed the heart of the Father to see his son suffer and die in this way, Jesus did it. Why? Because we are not just flesh and blood. That's why. Because he knew that he had to do it in order to save us from our sin and to overcome death for us. There was no other way. It's a comforting truth, church, to know. Our great high priest, our Savior, welcomes us to be honest and pour out our hearts to him about our fear of death. He knows. He understands. And as simple as it sounds, I wonder how many of us who struggle with a deep fear of dying or a deep fear of anything, really, have ever just honestly come before God in prayer to confess that. And welcomed him to minister to us in our weakness and in our fear. I mean, have you ever prayed to God to speak to you through his word or to lead you to others who can provide you with the comfort that they themselves have received in their own experiences with death? Have you ever done that? If you've never done that, maybe that's a good place for us to start. Just acknowledge it. Telling God how afraid of death you really are. And invite him to minister to you in that. In fact, today, after service, uh, if there's anyone who struggled with this, and, or, or really anything else that's like this crippling fear, and you just want to be prayed over and spend time in prayer, I, I welcome this. Let's do it. Let's do it after service today. I, I really would love to do that. Not just for your sake, but for mine too. But let me clarify this.
before we go into our main passage, because we're still in our introduction right now. Actually, we're, we're, we're over halfway done. I'm just kidding. I, I sensed fear right there. Like, oh, is, is that true? Let me clarify something. Okay, fear in and of itself is not always a bad thing, right? Fear is part of how God wired us to help ensure our survival, to help us make good decisions every day, to protect us. But the kind of fear that has become so pervasive today is this crippling kind of fear, an irrational fear, the kind of fear that literally keeps us up at night. And let me make this clear. It is not God's will that we live under that kind of crippling fear. Yes, God may allow us to experience certain fears for various reasons, but this crippling kind of fear that just shuts you down and makes you afraid to walk out of your house, that's not God's will. That kind of crippling fear is a scheme of Satan, plain and simple. Satan wants us to be enslaved and held captive by our fear, especially our fear of death, because he knows how much that affects us. And takes our eyes off of our Savior. How much that ushers in doubt in our lives. So then, how can we live victoriously over the fear of death? Let's go ahead and rise now. We're going to read Romans 8, our main passage for today. Again, from the New Living Translation. We'll just rise for this first part, verses 31 through 34. And then we're going to look at some key principles from this passage that speak into this. And I actually, again, would love to have us all read this together. Okay, let's read this together. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Amen. Please be seated. And let's look at this first principle together. And it's good that we start here. It's good that we start. If you are a child of God... If you are a child of God, nothing can stand against you, not even death. Apostle Paul declared, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? You could also say in the same way, that if God is for us, what can ever be against us? This is a truth that's worth repeating again and again. God is for you. God is for you. He is not against you. God is for you. You know, I've just been repeating that, that to myself. You know, the whole preaching to yourself thing that I kind of mentioned quite a bit, because I believe that, that's very biblical. We see that over and over again in Scripture, the need to preach to yourself. I've been doing that over and over again. God is for you. God is for me. God is for me. And if God is for you, then nothing can come against you. Nothing can thwart God's purpose and plan for your life from being completely fulfilled. And nothing, not even death, can have the last word in your life. Let me say that again. Your life will be 100% fulfilled according to God's purpose and plan for you. And death cannot take that away. You know what that means for us as believers? We should be far more concerned about how we live 
than about when or how we will die. Far more concerned about life than about our death. It was a late 18th century American poet, Henry Van Dyke, who once wrote, some people are so afraid to die that they never begin to live. Some people are so afraid to die they never begin to live. Let's simply remind ourselves whom we belong to. Remind ourselves who our God is. And let this realization fuel a Christ-centered fearlessness in our souls that could stare death in the face and not back down. You know, during lunch yesterday, a conversation with my son about conquering our fears. He has a few fears in his life. And as much as I want to tell him just to man up, if I'm honest, I was kind of like him when I was younger. He got it from me. So we're talking about that. And I shared with him about some of the fears I had when I was a little younger than he is. And it dawned on me that as I reflected on the various fears I had, there was only one way for me to really overcome every single one of them. There was only one way. It doesn't matter what the source of the fear was, whether it was my fear of getting my loose tooth pulled out by my dad with that terrifying, tiny dental floss loop that he would slowly tie around my tooth. And that was like one of the deepest fears of my childhood. I just hated that. You know, nowadays these kids expect you to take them to the dentist to get the tooth. What's going on, guys? You know? They would tie our, you know, floss to a door and you know shut it and you know, we do all sorts of stuff like that growing up. Now they want to go to a dentist? Come on, right? You have to face your fear. Not numb it. You gotta face your fear. My fear of roller coasters. Oh, I was so terrified of roller coasters. There's only one way to get rid of that. My friend forced me one day, bro, you just gotta do it. And I loved roller coasters after that. I still do. I can just do only one now. And after that, I'm like done, right? My fear of public speaking. I would, my stomach would start turning. I would get upset stomach. I'd sweat when I'd have to talk in front of people. The list goes on and on. The only way to overcome those fears was by having the courage to meet them head on. And not try to run from them or be afraid and hide. You know, as believers, we can do the same when it comes to the schemes of Satan and our fear of death. We can just be so terrified that we just, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. We, we want to run away from it as much as we possibly can. Now, no one enjoys talking about death. Of course not. But you know, that's one of the schemes of Satan, right? To make you so freaked out about it that it just does something to you. Where it just takes your eyes off of God in a very, very powerful way. You know what we need to do? Learn to face it head on. One of the easiest and effective ways to do that is talk about it more. Talk about your fear of death with others. And you'll be surprised how many of them say, oh my gosh, I struggle with the same thing. Allow others who have experienced the death of a loved one in a profound way to share their story with you. Listen to their story. Invite them to share about their pain, their grief, their anxiety, but also the wisdom and comfort they gain through it all. Have the courage to minister to others who have recently lost someone close to them. And you know, these are just some examples of how you can live in the freedom of knowing God is for you. That you have nothing to fear because 
Death will never have the last word in your life. Your life is in God's sovereign hands. Church, God is for you. He's for you. Let's continue in verses 35 and 37. Through 37. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? Or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger? Or threatened with death, as the scriptures say? For your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. You know, one of the most common fears when it comes to the fear of death is actually the fear of how we will die. The fear of cancer, the fear of having a heart attack, the fear of whatever, right? That's, for a lot of people, actually the bigger source of the fear is, is, are those very things. And what's interesting is that Apostle Paul here actually speaks in verse 35 directly into that because he's actually listing out all the ways that he himself had faced death on practically a daily basis. Whether it was trouble, calamity, persecution, hunger, when he was in danger or he was threatened. I mean, this is stuff he was dealing with all the time and he's actually talking about forms of death. And he says emphatically after that list that no, despite all the possible ways his physical life may be taken away, he declared no, despite whatever may happen to me, overwhelming victory is mine through Christ who loves me. We don't need to fear how we will die. Because no matter what form that may take, our overwhelming victory in the love of Christ is secure. The end result, regardless of how our physical life may end, is the victory of meeting our Savior face to face as he welcomes us home. I love what Helen Keller, the great Helen Keller, said about death. This is actually one of my favorite quotes about death, which is kind of a weird thing to say, like my favorite quote about death. But it's actually one of my favorite quotes really ever. We all know about Helen Keller, right, from her history books? Truly an American hero. She was blind since the age of 19 months, but became one of the most famous American authors and activists of all time and she said this death is no more than passing from from one room into another but there is a difference for me because in that other room i shall be able to see that's the sound of victory that's the kind of fearless spirit we can share, we can have, because God is for us. I'm sure in one form or another, all of us have something, something that we wish was different about our lives. Whether it's a physical issue, a social, financial, whatever it might be, emotional. There's something about us that we view as a weakness, something about us we wish could be different. Something about us we wish God would change. You know, part of the blessing of being set free from this body is that in the perfection of our eternal home, that will be no more. Let's read the last part, verses 38 and 39. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. 
No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Apostle Paul makes it as clear as can be. Neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God. Your doubt cannot even separate you from the love of God. If you disown him, he will not disown you. If you let go of him, he will not let go of you. That term, separate us from the love of God, by the way, is another way of saying, separate us from God's sovereign purpose and plan for our lives. Nothing can separate us from that. And what stands out the most to me here is the phrase, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. You know, one of the aspects of death that is most unsettling is the uncertainty of the future, right? We don't know when we'll die or what will happen to our loved ones if we die unexpectedly. And that's one of those that really bothers a lot of people too. Some of you may not fear death for your own sake, but you fear it because of what might happen to your family or to your loved ones and you're afraid. That can be very terrifying. I understand that. I feel the same way. But that's exactly what this passage is speaking into. Despite the uncertainty of the future for us and our loved ones, no matter what happens to us, we know that the love of God will cover us, our families, our friends, those most cherished in our lives. Nothing will separate them from the love of God, too. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's true. We don't know what tomorrow holds. So we have a choice to make, don't we? We can either choose to be held captive by the fear of the unknown, or we can choose to live every day to the fullest, which is the call of the gospel. Let's focus on living to the fullest in Christ every day. To do two simple things. To know God. And to make him known. Live every day to the fullest. If at all possible. Do not wait until tomorrow. To do something you know is right to do today. I'll say that again. If at all possible. Do not wait until tomorrow. To do something you know is right to do today. Because tomorrow may never come. And if it doesn't, that's okay. Because we know no matter what tomorrow holds, victory is ours in Christ Jesus. No matter what tomorrow holds, God is for us. No matter what tomorrow holds, we can be fearless in Christ.